Well, I've only just arrived back from my northeastern vacation less than 18 hours ago, and I think I'm ready to preach on this chapter on knowledge. I took note of the things I was learning in the last three weeks in honor of this chapter, the things that I knew, the things that I knew in my heart. And they ranged from what I learned at the Saratoga racetrack, never to bet on a horse named Fear and Greed, <laughs> to the awareness of the unstoppable wheel of time as I watched my children play in the field at my parents' rural house in Massachusetts or looked in the mirror or observed my aging parents or sat with my family around the apple tree to bury my grandmother's ashes alongside the other grandparents. These weeks I have been aware of the wheel of time turning. I made a list of what I know from these last three weeks of vacation, including these. I observed that it is good to leave home once in a while. And it is good to enter into the natural world with as few comforts as possible as I camped and stood on the mountains of Acadia National Park in Maine looking out over the Atlantic. I was aware of the power of the natural world to remind me of my small part in all that we experience. I know that Global climate change is real and serious. Everyone I met on these three weeks was talking about the weather, not just what was coming and going, but the drought in the Northeast, the lack of snow in Vermont and Maine, and the lime ticks that are moving north, infecting many, many people. I know, again, that long drives with two children in the back of a car can be maddening <laughs> and should be avoided. <laughs> and I know that the love of family is both a difficult thing and also irreplaceable. My list goes on, but to the chapter at hand on knowledge. As you know, or if you are here for the first time. We've been engaged with Karen Armstrong, the historian and theologian, reading the book, The Twelve Steps to a Compassionate Life. We are nearing the end. And in this chapter, this tenth step, she asks us to look at knowledge. And there are two words in this chapter that are most important. They are, but why? She says very clearly in this chapter, when you come up against something difficult, keep asking, but why? We have all had to answer this question. We are good at answering this question often. Some of us who spent time with children, like Louis C.K. in the video, I showed earlier from the Lucky Louis show, we know that children are good at the question, why? I love his answer to the question that starts, can we go out and play, to the explanation of the universe, to his failures, <laughs> ending in a theological statement that God is dead and we are alone, <laughs> to which the little girl says, okay, but why? Two words in this chapter. And I want to come back to that video later and that answer. The question Armstrong poses in this chapter is whether or not we can confront not what we don't know, but rather what we think we know. In other words, can we confront those ideas that come in the form of our own prejudice and our own ignorance about what we think we know? In case you aren't reading the book, which is fine, but in case you aren't reading the book, she recommends in this chapter that we do a simple exercise 
She says, choose a people or a country that you think you know something about but should learn more about. Say, Mormons, perhaps, as we run up to November. Or Turks or Lithuanians. She recommends we go and we learn about those people. To tell you the truth, this chapter has about as much in it to preach on as an empty barrel <laughs> of beer. There is rarely a thing there. So I thought actually I would preach a sermon on epistemology, a study of how we know. But what I know is that about five minutes into that sermon, most of you will be asleep. <laughs> Except for the five or six of you who, who would say to me, I've been waiting for that sermon for years. <laughs> Knowledge is what she asks us to examine. Why is it important? The Buddhists and the philosophers have spoken about knowledge. The Buddhists say knowledge can become self-knowledge, a grounding force in our lives, a certain kind of knowledge that asks us to be a little more present, a little more steady. For the Buddhists, that notion that we are present to this very moment is as much knowledge as we need. The Buddhist teacher and scholar Joan Halifax challenges our common understanding of knowledge. She says, we learn things, but they become prejudice. Our attachments to viewpoints and outcomes distort our ability to be present to each other. And the Western philosophers have said knowledge is prime real estate in understanding our world. Plato offered three analyses of knowledge. All those who want that epistemology sermon, this is your moment. Plato said first, knowledge and perception are the same. Second, analysis, his second analysis was that true belief is knowledge. And third, he said that true belief accompanied by a rational account is knowledge. Socrates rejected all these things, saying we can perceive without knowing and we can know without perceiving, like we can hear a foreign language but not understand it. That we can believe without knowing, like a jury can believe a defendant is guilty just by hearing the prosecutor's argument rather than seeing the evidence, and that all interpretation of experience, Socrates said, is inadequate because we vary in our interpretations. Western philosophy has been trying to figure out what knowledge is for years, but they have not come that close. And the philosophers continued, in religion, this is the debate between revelation and reason, reason being how we can think about what is real, what is true, and revelation, how we receive information from the divine about what is true and what is real. Long debates have been given over the difference between reason and revelation. Those debates remind me of a story of a man who fell into a well and halfway down he grabbed onto a root and he wondered what he would do if he let go of the root, he would fall to his death, but he couldn't climb up. So he did what we would do. He yelled, is there anybody up there? And the clouds parted and a thundering voice said, I am your Lord, the God of your life. Let go of the root and I will save you. And the man thought for a moment and said, is there anybody else up there? Reason and revelation may lead us to knowledge. And remember Descartes, who said, I think, therefore I am. It's the only thing we remember about Descartes, mostly. <laughs> Poor Descartes. But he arrived at that statement wondering if there was anything that he could doubt away. He started with the heavens, easy to doubt. He could not see or touch the heavens. 
and ended with his own existence, asking, do I exist? Harder to doubt. But what he learned was that he couldn't doubt his own doubting. His own doubting was real. Therefore, was a doubter there, proving once again that doubt is faith and that faith is doubt. Confirming for us Unitarian Universalists that we know the answer to some of our questions, which is to ask the question, but why? And keep going. Revelation and reason. These philosophical arguments have confused us about our own faith, I think. The use of reason, long championed by Unitarians, doesn't mean that there is a lack of spiritual engagement, just like Descartes found out. In fact, I would say the real use of reason is a spiritual experience. In and of itself, can lead to revelation. If we are honest with ourselves about all philosophy and humanism and scientific reasoning, it leads us back to where we started, the question, but why? Immanuel Kant said, our sensory reason can't perceive everything. So there is a necessary crack through which the mystery can be left alone or visited or waited upon, the mystery that changes lives, enlightens, and cracks us open, the mystery we find in new questions. Now, all this philosophical gymnastics would not get us a gold medal in the Olympics, I assure you. But I think it leads us to where Armstrong wants us to go. She urges us to learn, but she urges us to be prepared for the mystery to crack us open, that which we find, to ask the question continually, but why? Which is not a resting place, but a place to move forward in our pursuit of what is true. It is a kind of mantra that reminds us also that we can't know everything. And when our viewpoints become prejudice, we must return to that mantra, but why? And help us go deeper. Which brings me back to Lucky Louie's answer to his daughter in our video. Because I don't believe that we are alone or that God is dead, but let me explain. When we have the kinds of experiences that break us open to the world, that expand our knowledge of who we are or who others are, whether learning about them in the library or having aha revelatory moments that crack us open, there is the web of creation and the mystery of the divine. I don't believe that these experiences are given to us by a hopeful God, but rather that they are God. The mystery that urges us to keep asking, but why? The divine that asks us to keep probing in what is real and what is true. I think in some ways that is what Karen Armstrong means for us to learn, although I don't know if that is in the chapter. I think she wants us to go beyond more facts about Mormons and Lithuanians and Turks, but to know more deeply that when we lead with the question, but why, we have the key to meeting the world and becoming more open to seeing others with compassionate eyes. So here's a story. <clears throat> the story is about an event that happened at the church, the Unitarian Church in Sacramento, California, where the minister of my childhood served. He told me this story. One day he got a call from a young gay man dying of AIDS who lived on the fringe of the church. 
He hardly knew his name, but he asked if the minister could come visit him. The minister, reluctant to go due to his workload, went anyway, knowing a deeper love had to guide him. The man asked him to conduct a different kind of memorial based on the kind of knowing that pulls us toward compassion. He asked that when he died, he invite friends and family to arrive at the church, not to sit in pews for a worship or celebration of his life, but to sit at round tables in the dining area of the church when the family and the friends who didn't ever meet came to the church for the memorial, they found round tables with their name tags like one would have at a fancy dinner, and they found their seats. Half the table, family. Half the table, friends. John spoke about the man's life, what he loved and what broke his heart, what he accomplished and what he had failed at. He said the man requested that his friends and his family come to celebrate his life by sitting at those tables to finally know each other. Food was brought out. The people talked and met over the meal. And when they left, my friend, the minister, watched as the two groups exchanged hugs and embraces as tears were shed for the loved one who had died, as trust had been built where suspicion was before. The origin of knowledge, says Parker Palmer in his book, To Know As We Are Known, the origin of knowledge is love a knowledge that springs from compassion will implicate us in the web of life. It will wrap the knower and the known in compassion in a bond of awesome responsibility as well as transforming joy. It will call us to involvement, mutuality, and accountability. The origin of knowledge is love. this kind of knowing that happened at the tables in that church on that one day in Sacramento that broke down the prejudice of two sides, this kind of knowing is what Karen Armstrong asks us to do in our lives. To find ways to start with the question, but why, and end in our ability to change or even sacrifice to rebind our broken world so that knowing is not just a scientific thing, but an act of love. I'm pretty sure that is what Karen Armstrong means when she says we should learn about others. Not just by reading about them, but by sitting at the table, if we can, across the battle lines to see their humanity in a different form. We are not alone. The divine is not dead. It is here, in and beyond us, urging us forward toward the knowledge of each other. I wish you the best of luck with this chapter. Thus far, the hardest chapter to preach from, perhaps the hardest chapter to live from as we go further now into the 12 steps to a compassionate life. May you cross the borders you need to cross. May you challenge your prejudices and your ignorance, not in what you know, but in what you think you know. And may it be a spiritual act. Amen and amen.